The Nancy Drew Files, case number one, Secrets Can Kill by Carolyn Keene. Chapter 13. The floodlights lit up the Mustang, throwing everything outside it into pitch darkness except for the two headlights. They were dancing over the bumpy drive, looming closer and closer. Who do you suppose that is? Bess squinted in the glare. It's coming awfully fast. George cleared her throat. Somehow I don't think it's the welcoming committee. Let's get out of here, cried Nancy. As the headlights approached the gate, Nancy stepped on the gas, steering the Mustang into a tire-screeching U-turn, and peeled out of the drive. Just as they neared Bedford Road, Bess let out a faint shriek and pointed to a clump of bushes at the end of the drive. Nancy gasped. Jumping over the bushes and onto the drive directly in front of the car were two figures. In the beam of the headlights, the girls could see that they were men, dressed in black jumpsuits of some kind. One was hefting a long-barreled pistol. The other was unslinging a rifle from his shoulder. Instinctively, Nancy moved her foot onto the brake pedal, but then she stopped. What am I doing, she said. If they think I'm going to slow down and make small talk while a gun is pointed at me, they're crazy. Nancy moved her foot back to the gas pedal and stepped on it, mashing down on the horn at the same time. Bess put her hands over her eyes, but George and Nancy saw the two men hold their pose, legs wide apart, guns at the ready for about two seconds. Then, as the Mustang bore down on them, they jumped aside. Wheels spinning and gravel flying, the car swerved sharply onto Bedford Road. Are we going to live? Bess asked. Not if we don't hurry, Nancy answered. Look! Behind them, turning out of the private drive and coming fast, was a dark-colored, unmarked van. It's not over yet, Nancy said. Let's see how far they're willing to go. Except for Nancy's car and the van, Bedford Road was nearly deserted. Nancy raced the car past the other estates, past the high school, past a solitary jogger in white. The van stayed close behind, not losing an inch. Suddenly, Nancy saw a traffic light ahead of her. It was green, and Nancy eased up on the gas pedal. What are you doing? Bess cried. They'll catch us. Maybe, maybe not. Nancy slowed as much as possible, keeping her eyes on the traffic light. Behind them, the van's headlights were bright enough to read by. The light changed to amber, and Nancy felt a jolt as the van rammed into the back of her car. George's head snapped back as the van once again made contact with the Mustang. Uh, Nancy, she said, if you're going to do what I think you're going to do, do it now. The light's been yellow for five seconds. Right. Hang on. Nancy pushed the gas pedal and raced through the intersection just after the light turned red. The van's brakes screeched, but then its driver decided to risk running a light. It tore through the intersection only a few feet behind the Mustang. Nancy shook her head in disbelief. Where are the police when you really need them, she joked. Actually, she was glad that a police car hadn't been lurking at the intersection. A high-speed chase through the streets of Bedford might get the driver of the van in trouble, but when he showed his diplomatic papers or whatever he carried around with him, he'd be off the hook. Then Nancy could do one of two things, blow her cover or get arrested. Neither choice was very appealing. Reluctantly, Nancy slowed her car to a respectable speed. Anybody got any suggestions? She asked. Bess spoke up immediately. Let's eat. Oh, Bess, George said with a moan. Get serious, will you? There's a lunatic on our tail. I am serious, Bess protested. There's a pizza place just ahead on the right, and it looks jammed. Do you really think those creeps would follow us in there? I'm ready to try anything, Nancy said, and swerved sharply into the parking lot of Guido's Pizza. As she squeezed the car into the last available space, she glanced into the rearview mirror. The van slowed for a moment, then sped down the block and out of sight. It worked, she said with a shaky laugh. It worked, she said with a shaky laugh. You were right, Bess. I guess it would have blown their image if they'd followed us to Guido's and shot us over a pepperoni pie. Speaking of pepperoni, Bess said, I really am starving. So am I, Nancy agreed. Let's go pig out. Guido's was jammed, as Bess had predicted, but the three girls managed to find a table near the kitchen door. As Nancy sank into a chair, she glanced around and saw several kids from Bedford High, including Carla Dalton. Terrific, she thought. Carla is a quick way to ruin an appetite. Carla was talking to somebody whose back was to Nancy. She was so involved in whatever she was saying that she didn't notice anyone else. When their pizza arrived, Nancy discovered that not even Carla Dalton could kill her appetite. Hungrily, she and Bess and George wolfed down slices of big pie, not saying much of anything. When only one slice was left, Nancy leaned back in her chair and sipped her Coke. Well, we finally know what Daryl's secret is, she said quietly. And it's a lot worse than shoplifting. Bess nodded. It really is unbelievable, though. I mean, a high school kid involved in spying? Who would ever guess? That was probably the point, George said. 
But Daryl's not the worst one. That man from the defense plant and probably one of the diplomats, they're the real bad guys. Daryl's not squeaky clean, though, Nancy remarked. I'm sure he knew exactly what he was doing. She wasn't really shocked anymore, just angry. And she was more angry at herself than at Daryl. If only she hadn't been so stupid, such an easy mark for Daryl's charms. If she'd kept her mind on her job and her hands to herself, she wouldn't be feeling like such a sucker. First things first, she told herself. Solve the case, then you can kick yourself for being such a dummy. Bess broke into her thoughts. What kind of stuff do you think Daryl was taking from the guy at the defense plant? Blueprints? Secret designs for bombs? Probably, Nancy said, and I'll bet it paid really well. Well enough, she figured, to keep gas in Daryl's Porsche and a grin on his face. Daryl did it for the money, I'm sure, not for any political reason. I guess it beat bagging groceries after school, George commented. Daryl must have thought he had it made. He did, until Jake found out, Nancy said. It must have freaked him out, but he was so cool, you never would have guessed. What an actor. Had Daryl been acting with her, too, she wondered, coming on to her just so that she wouldn't suspect him? She had to admit that that was exactly what he'd done, and she'd fallen for it. Well, she'd stopped falling, and now her eyes were open. What I have to find out, she told the other two, is who killed Jake. Was it someone from the compound, or the man at the defense plant, or was it Daryl, or Hal, or Walt, or Connie? Do you really think Daryl could have done something like that? Bess asked. I'm just not sure, Nancy admitted, but I have to find out. The question is how. I can't just walk up and... She broke off suddenly. What is it? George asked. Look who's here. Nancy pointed to Carla Dalton's table. Carla and the person she'd been with had stood up and were threading their way through the crowded room. Carla's companion was Brenda Carlton. They were headed towards Nancy. What's the ace reporter doing here? George wondered. She'd better not be following me, Nancy said grimly. We made a deal. If she messes me up, I'll take her reporter's notebook and burn it. Who's she with? Bess asked. Oh, that's the famous Carla Dalton, Nancy laughed. The one who likes to let people fall off trampolines. She giggled and then whispered. I wonder what she'd say if she knew her ex-boyfriend was a spy. She'd probably chew him out for being stupid enough to get caught, Bess joked. As Brenda and Carla approached the girls' table, Brenda gave Nancy a sideways glance and a nasty wink. Nancy felt like throwing the last slice of pizza at her and watching tomato sauce ooze down Brenda's black suede boots, but she held herself back. Carla was chattering away about Bedford High's big dance as she and Brenda walked by, but she took the time to jostle the girls' table hard enough to spill Nancy's Coke. Bess took a wad of napkins out of the container and handed them to Nancy. Carla doesn't give up, does she? She said, seething. I don't understand why you haven't gotten back at her. But Nancy had other things on her mind. Brenda, for one. Had she been following them? If she had, Nancy would have to be super careful. The case was at its trickiest point. She couldn't afford to let Brenda's nose for news get even a whiff of what was going on. Then there was Daryl Gray. How was she going to handle him? Of course, she said suddenly. Carla just gave me the answer. The answer to what? George asked. How to get Daryl to spill his guts, Nancy told her. Bess, you said Alan Wales is playing at the dance tomorrow night, right? So you'll be there, won't you? Of course, Bess said dreamily. I'm his biggest fan. Good. I might need your help, Nancy turned to George. Yours too. But I don't have a date. I've got one for you. I don't like blind dates, George protested. Trust me, Nancy said with a grin. You'll love the guy I have in mind. So how are you going to handle Daryl? Bess wanted to know. Very carefully, Nancy said. But no matter what, tomorrow night, I'm going to pop the question to him. Only it won't be what he's expecting.